an investment you can't lose. Jesus talked a great deal about money. 16 of his 38 parables pertain to the handling of money and possessions. In the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, an amazing one out of every 10 verses, or 288 verses in all, deal directly with the subject of money and our possessions. There are approximately 500 verses in the Bible on prayer, another 500 on faith, but a whooping 2,000 verses on money and possessions. Money must be an important subject to God. Many people spend a lot of time worrying about money problems, about how to pay for the things they want and need. They worry about the future too. Will they have enough to live on when they retire? What will happen when they are too old or too ill to work any longer? God never intended that you and I would have to worry about the present or the future. If we would trust in Him, we would not need to worry about what is going to happen to us. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. Let's take a look at God's eternal security plan for us. It all started back in the Garden of Eden. Planet Earth had just come from the Creator's hands in all its splendor and perfection, glorious beyond description. The stroke of the master artist greeted the eye at every turn. Magnificent sunrises were rivaled only by breathtaking sunsets. Peaceful lakes nestled between the hills. Gorgeous flowers of every hue and blossoming vines delighted the senses. Songbirds filled the air with their melodious songs. Animals in the lush meadows played and roamed and afraid. How Adam and Eve must have enjoyed the perfect world God had made for them. But there was more. The Lord God planted a garden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 Just think, somewhere amid the wonder and beauty of the newborn world, God designed a garden home for Adam and Eve. Not only did God provide a lovely home for them, He also explained the wonderful food He had provided for them. I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29 Adam and Eve have no bills to pay, no taxes to worry about, no locks or keys, no vandals or burglars, no hospitals or drugstores. They enjoyed perfect health and endless youth and dying commitment to each other and a boundless love for God. God wanted them to share these blessings, so He said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 God also knew that mankind should have a work to do, task that would produce a sense of accomplishment. He gave mankind responsibility for oversight of this beautiful new world. He told Adam and Eve, Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 and chapter 2 verse 15 While everything in the world belongs to God, He entrusted mankind with the stewardship of the earth. God is the owner. We are the stewards, managing God's property. The Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 24 verse 1 Again, God says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Psalm chapter 50 verses 10 and 11 It is God who gives us the ability to make money. We really don't own anything. As our Creator, God has a claim on our possessions and our lives. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 Webster's New World Dictionary defines steward as 
one who acts as a supervisor of finances and property for another. Today, when a person enters into a stewardship relationship, he wants to know what the owner expects of him. This is the understanding God had with Adam, for the Bible states, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 God tested man's love and loyalty. Adam and Eve could eat from all the other trees in the garden, but they were not to eat the fruit of that specific tree. By obeying God, they would show their recognition of His ownership. If they were faithful stewards and choose to maintain their allegiance to God, they would live forever in a world that was a paradise. Adam and Eve failed the one simple test God required of them. They were unfaithful stewards and they lost everything, their garden home, immortality, love, happiness, security, clear consciences, and face-to-face -face walks and talks with God. They fell from royalty to slavery. And behind it all, in deep satisfaction, was Satan, the rebel angel who hoped to have full control of earth forever. However, Satan's dominion was shattered by Christ's entrance into the world centuries later. Satan's plan was to deceive the divine Son of God as easily as he had deceived Adam and Eve. Satan waited until Jesus had fasted for forty days. The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Matthew chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 Satan hoped to entice Jesus with the kingdoms of this world, but he did not succeed. The things that Satan had promised to give Christ were not his to give. He had stolen a planet by fraud and deceit. And Jesus would not sell out his relationship with his Father for the things of this world. Ultimately, Satan's fate was forever sealed at Calvary. By Christ's death on the cross, Satan was defeated. Christ's death made possible the restoration of planet Earth. Everything we are and everything we have has been made possible by Christ's eternal gift to the human family. Whether we love him or not, our very lives and all our possessions are His property. Not only is He our Creator, He is our Redeemer. And like Adam and Eve, we are stewards of what God entrusts to us. So what does He require of us? Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 I want to be a faithful steward, don't you? But over what is it that we have been given stewardship? The greatest of all God's gifts is life itself. The Apostle Paul declares, God, who made the world and everything in it, gives to all life, breath, and all things. Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. Our life originates with God, and He sustains it. Every heartbeat, every breath of air, every pulse of our bodies is a gift from God. Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. A living sacrifice means an reserved commitment or submission to Christ and His leadership in our lives. Christ, who went about doing good, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. He is our example. We are to follow His example of unselfish service for others. We are not only stewards of the gift of life, we are also stewards of our time. Someone has said that time is the stuff life is made of. The psalmist requested of God, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalm chapter 90 verse 12 To waste time is to waste life to squander the talent which God Himself has given to each man and woman. Every person has the same number of hours in a day, the same number of minutes in those hours, and will be held accountable for the choices made to fill them. God also asks us to set aside a specific time period, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, 
and dedicate those hours for worshiping our Creator. While all our time belongs to God, He asked that the seventh-day Sabbath be devoted to fellowship with Him, resting in His Word, and drawing refreshment from His promises. He invites us to put aside the weekly pressures of work, shopping, and worldly pursuits, and remember Him as our Creator and Redeemer. We are also stewards of the talents that God gives us. Well, you ask, what are the specific talents for which we are responsible as God's stewards? I don't think I have any talents. When we think of a talent, we usually think of the ability to sing well, play an instrument, paint a picture, speak well, write, or organize. Our talents are not to be used to get the praise of men or to earn merit with God. They are loaned to us to bless others. Paul wrote, And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 We are also stewards of the money that God gives us. As we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness that is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we discover God's blessings are showered upon us. In addition to giving of our time, we find in Scripture that dedication to God includes returning to Him a portion of His material blessings. One day, Abraham's nephew, Lot, and his family were taken captive from their home in Sodom by an enemy tribe. When the news reached Abraham, he determined to rescue Lot and the others. He prayed for God to be with him and give him success. God was with him. Lot and his family were rescued and treasures of the enemy were brought back. When Abraham approached Sodom, the king came out to meet him, urging him to keep the treasures he had recovered, only returning the captives. But Abraham refused to take anything for himself. Melchizedek, a priest of God, brought Abraham a meal and blessed him. Then Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Genesis chapter 14 verse 20. Abraham wanted to express his appreciation for God's help in securing the release of Lot, acknowledging God's ownership and blessings. 150 years later, Abraham's grandson expressed his gratitude to God in the same way. While fleeing from his angry brother, Jacob felt utterly alone and afraid. He desperately wanted the protection of God, but he felt so guilty for robbing his brother Esau that he feared God had forsaken him and would not forgive him. With a great sense of remorse, Jacob confessed his wrongs to God and then wearily lay down on the ground and slept. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Genesis chapter 28 verse 12 When Jacob awoke, he knew God had spoken, promising guidance and protection. Deeply touched, he gratefully promised, Of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you, that is found in Genesis chapter 28 Verse 22, King David felt the same way when he asked, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Psalm chapter 116, verse 12. Have you ever wondered how to thank God for his incredible goodness to you, for the gift of life, family, health, material blessings? Do you sometimes wonder if thank you is enough? The Bible principle of stewardship provides a tangible way of expressing our appreciation to God for all His benefits. The first written instruction regarding tithing or returning a tenth to the Lord is recorded in the book of Leviticus. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. As we return the Lord's tithe, we are continually impressed with the truth that God is the Creator and the source of every blessing. And how is the tithe to be used? The book of Numbers gives a clear explanation. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Numbers chapter 18 verse 21. Throughout the Bible, we find that the tithe always supported the work of God's ministry. 
In the New Testament, Paul explains, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should leave from the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. Christ commended the tithing system at the same time he rebuked the scribes and Pharisees for their narrow-minded approach to religion. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the wittier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. This you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Matthew chapter 23 verse 23. Perhaps you are wondering how you could possibly give a tenth of your income to the Lord. Many people have wondered that. But then somehow, they made the decision to trust God's guidance and wisdom and to return the tithe to Him. Weeks later, these same persons enthusiastically testified that a miracle had happened in their lives. Somehow, nine-tenths of their income stretched farther than the ten-tenths ever did. Here is the secret to financial security. There was Maria who squeezed an honest tithe out of a scant paycheck. It seemed hard at first, but later she was blessed with her own business that flourished and brought financial security. Now she gives God the credit for her financial success and delights in giving to advance the Lord's work. Or take Eid, for example, who took a leap of faith by closing his business on Sabbaths, the busiest day of the week, only to be rewarded by increased business on the other six days of the week. God is a promise keeper. Such Christians have discovered firsthand the blessings promised in Malachi. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. The Lord says, the tenth of all our increase is holy to Him. He gives us the privilege of returning it to Him in order to test our stewardship, to see if we will honor and acknowledge His ownership. If we refuse to do that, we are actually robbing God, according to the Bible. But you say, in what way we have robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. While the tithe or tenth part of our income belongs to God, we are invited to give abundantly even beyond that portion which is already rightfully God's. With offerings, it is left up to each of us to decide how far our generosity is to extend. However, there are some guidelines in the Bible. Jesus said, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Luke chapter 6 verse 38. God's plan for financing His work on earth is simple and beautiful. He asks His people to give from their hearts, never fearing for their own needs, which will ultimately be met far beyond expectation. Perhaps you are thinking, if God owns everything, the gold, silver, cattle, and land, and us, why does He need my money? In addition to helping us develop our trust in Him, the tithing system is God's plan for financing His work on earth. He never intended the church to be financed by lotteries, bingo games, or raffles. And isn't tithing a responsible way to finance the ministry? Each person gives according to what he receives. If you earn a thousand dollars, you return one hundred dollars to God. If you earn a hundred, you return ten dollars. Could anything be fairer? Whatever we give to God, He gives more to us. We always receive more than we give. As we share our blessings with others, we grow in love and compassion, becoming more and more like Jesus. One of Jesus' fascinating parables was about a diligent, industrious farmer who worked hard and had a tremendous crop at harvest time. The harvest was so great that his barns couldn't contain it. They were already bursting and the crop wasn't in yet. What could he do? He struggled over the decision. Should he give the excess to the poor? But he thought, it's mine. Had not he been the one who planned carefully? Hadn't he been the one who had worked so hard? 
he convinced himself of what to do. I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Luke chapter 12 verses 18 and 19. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Luke chapter 12 verses 20 and 21. This rich farmer did not acknowledge where his blessings came from. He did not recognize his creator or his obligation as a steward. He utterly forgot the poor, the orphans, the widows, or homeless. He thought only of himself. This man had a heart problem. Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew chapter 6 verse 21 Jesus was very serious about our attitude toward our possessions. If not surrendered to Jesus, they could lead us away from God, even resulting in the loss of eternal life. He said, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Matthew chapter 16 verse 26 The problem with modern man is that his life has become so complex and his schedule so busy that he either forgets or does not take time to remember from where all his blessings come. He fails to consider the price that was paid to redeem him from sin. As a result, he neglects to honor God with his time, talents, and his treasures. Each of us needs to be reminded daily that everything we have is a gift from God. Our lives are a gift from God. Our health is a gift from God. Every breath we take is a gift from God. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, the house we live in are gifts from God. When we give back to God, we are saying, Thank you, Lord, for what you have given me. Would you like to say, Lord, I want to place you first in my finances and in every area of my life. If you do, I invite you to bow down your head as we pray together. Shall we pray? Dear Father in heaven, today we want to recognize you as our Creator and Redeemer. We recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We thank you for providing us all our needs, for blessing us more than we can ever recognize or repay. Today, we want to make a commitment to be faithful stewards by your grace of that which you have entrusted to us. We want to be faithful not only in our tithes and love offerings, but also in our time, talents, energy, and health. We know that as we do so, you can do more for and through us. You can give us greater blessings and abilities and accomplishments for your name's honor and glory. We want to be all that we can be for you and for the world in need around us. Please see our hearts, see our needs, and keep us faithful to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.